Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Heterogeneous Parallel Programming class. We are at lecture point point seven. We're going to be focusing on handling boundary conditions in tiling. The objective of this lecture is to help you to learn to handle arbitrary matrix sizes in tiled matrix multiplication. And um, uh, we're going to be the, uh, going through boundary condition checking and um, how we can regularize the tile contents and then we would uh, also begin to think about performance and functionality trade-offs in parallel programming. During lecture 2.6, we uh, I mentioned that um, we were assuming that the matrix dimensions M, N, and K are all multiples of the tile size or tile width. However, uh, in reality, uh, this may not be true. In fact, many real-world applications come with arbitrary matrix sizes. So if the function in the library requires that um, the dimensions of M, N, and K all are multiples of uh, tile width, then um, it will cause some inconvenience um, to the uh, users. So a application developer who want to use this matrix multiplication function library, uh, library function will need to somehow adjust the dimensions so that um, these dimensions will indeed be multiples of the tile width. So uh, uh, an approach is padding the input matrix. So the application developer will need to add elements into the dimensions so that um, these dimensions will become multiples of the tile width. However, um, if you think about it, this can be a very expensive process. Because of the major, uh, row major layout, or column major layout for that matter, whenever we add elements into some of these dimensions, we actually need to shift all the elements after that point so that uh, we can accommodate the new additional elements in that dimension. So this can, uh, can be a very expensive process for, uh, that involves data shifting and involves some programming, even programming efforts from the developers in order to use these library functions. So here in this lecture, we introduce a much more user-friendly approach where uh, the input functions can actually just, the, uh, the functions can just handle arbitrary dimension matrices so that um, uh, the users don't have to spend either the programming effort or the, um, the computation time to prepare these matrices to fit the constraints of multiple uh, tile width. Here we show a simple example um, that is very similar to what we showed in lecture 2.6, but it's based on a three by three matrix multiplication. So um, in this case, we're still using two by two tiles. So um, as we can see in the picture, we still need to have two tiles in the uh, X the dimension and two tiles in the Y dimension in order to cover all the elements in the, uh, in the C matrix as well as the two input uh, um, A and B matrices. However, um, the, t the tiles other than the one, uh, the one that in is in the upper left corner for A and B will now involve invalid elements or non-existing elements for, uh, for those matrices. And also for uh, out output matrix C, we also have uh, situations where the uh, tiles would involve uh, elements that are not in the uh, valid range. For the C case, we have already seen how we can handle that by using if then else in the kernel to avoid uh, writing into these uh, elements. However, for uh, arrays uh, or matrices A and B, we need to have a different strategy that uh, we use in the uh, lecture 2.6 in order to handle these non-existing elements properly. So uh, let's take a look at the, a little bit more details of the operation when we load the, the tiles into shared memory. So uh, here we show the, uh, the loading phase, uh, loading for phase one of block zero, zero. So now we're loading the upper right corner tile of A and the lower left uh, corner of B. So uh, when we load these elements, remember every thread is going to be loading one element. So we, we, as we can see in this picture, 
thread 0, 1 and thread 1, 1 uh, will be loading non-existing A elements. It will, they will attempt to load A0, 3 and A1, 3, which do not exist in the A matrix. And because of the uh, row major layout, what will happen in reality is that um, the, uh, these two threads are going to be ac actually just loading A10 and A20, which will be adjacent to A02 and A12. And so uh, we will be loading uh, some uh, matrix A values that are not intended to be loaded into the uh, shared memory. So the, they will definitely cause some issues when we try to use these values. And the situation for B is a little bit different because thread 10 and thread 11 will try to load B30 and B31, which do not exist. And to, uh, even worse than the A case, the, uh, where these locations are outside the allocated range of the B matrix. So uh, the chances are they will likely trigger some kind of memory protection error for accessing a B element that is outside any of the valid uh, B uh, allocation range. So this can actually cause a termination of the kernel in some of the GPUs. Now let's take a quick look at the usage of the data once we loaded them into the uh, shared memory. So uh, during the uh, iteration zero of phase one of block zero zero, um, all the threads will actually be using valid data um, that we loaded from, uh, from the memory. So we will be using uh, the, uh, the A00 and A10 and B, uh, in, in the B case, we'll be using B, uh, uh, B20 and B21. So these are all good elements, so that's, there's no problem. However, when we get moved to iteration one, we're going to see that all the threads are now going to be uh, attempting to use incorrect values or invalid values uh, that we loaded in the uh, loading phase. So this, these values, what um, because they are not intended values for the calculation, we can easily uh, accumulate garbage values into the uh, C elements and destroy the out, uh, output of the, uh, the dot product. So the, this is definitely something that we need to avoid in our design. Just to show you that the situation is a little bit different uh, from thread block to thread block, here we show the, uh, the phase zero loads for uh, block one one. And um, uh, now we're loading from the lower left corner of A and the upper right corner of B. So um, the, in the A case, uh, we see that um, A, the situation for A and B are actually reversed compared to the block zero zero case. So here for A, uh, we see that uh, thread 10 and thread 11 will be attempting to load A30 and A31, which is which will be outside the allocated range uh, data range for A. And whereas in B, uh, we're going to, uh, thread 01 and thread 11 will be loading, uh, attempting to load B03 and B13, which would likely be B10 and B20 in a row major layout. So uh, here, B, the B values that we load are uh, going to be uh, garbage or the, uh, the values that we did not intend to have for, uh, for those uh, positions. So here we also show that even for the use of uh, in each phase, it can, the situation can vary from block to block. So um, remember, during iteration zero of block zero zero, all the threads were using uh, valid data. However, in this case, uh, we see that in iteration zero, thread zero one would be using uh, invalid data. So, uh, so we, we actually have a situation where uh, in all iterations, we could be uh, using inc invalid data for the calculation. And um, we also see that um, uh, thread, we have several threads that are attempting to, uh, to calculate for elements that are non-existing or um, in, in the uh, C matrix. Uh, 
So uh, in in this case, all the three elements uh, in non-existing elements are outside the allocated range of C. So any writes into these elements can potentially trigger uh, memory protection error and terminate the kernel. So we need, definitely need to be very careful with that. And there's another subtle kind of problem. If we look at the work, which we didn't show, but I'd like to encourage you to, uh, to, to write the, to uh, try it out, for block 01 here, uh, we would be, uh, one of the threads would be writing into, uh, or at least attempt to write into C03. In, in row major layout, it's going to be C10. And this is actually going to corrupt uh, one of the C elements that another thread is supposed to be working on. So we definitely need to make sure that we don't let these uh, threads to either write outside the valid range or incorrectly write into another C element that is really being calculated by another thread. In iteration one, we have a similar situation, but remember in uh, block zero, zero, all the threads were, use, uh, were uh, using uh, invalid value. But in this case, one of the threads, thread zero, zero, is actually using valid uh, value and calculate a required step for the C element C22. So um, it's not that we can just limit the number of iterations for all the threads and then uh, avoid you, uh, doing some of the invalid calculation. We really need to have a more systematic way to handle uh, these problems. So now uh, let me summarize uh, by giving you two major cases that we uh, need to consider when we design our solution. So the first case is that uh, threads that calculate valid C elements can actually step outside valid uh, input, uh, input values when they do the calculation. So this will be a, uh, exempl uh, exemplified by um, the uh, iteration one of phase uh, one of block zero zero. So even though all these threads are uh, calculating valid C elements, but as some iteration um, of, the, um, of the calculation loop, we may end up stepping outside the valid uh, range. So in this case, we have exhausted all the valid uh, uh, A and B elements that we loaded from the memory. So we shouldn't let the, uh, this particular iteration to, uh, to corrupt the uh, final result of these C elements. The other major case is that threads that uh, do not calculate a valid C elements, but they still need to participate in loading the input tiles. So the fact that they don't participate in calculating this uh, valid C elements doesn't mean that they can be tur uh, turned off for the entire duration of the kernel. Uh, this would be exemplified by uh, uh, the phase zero of block one one where thread one zero is assigned to calculate non-existing C element C32, but they need, uh, it needs to participate in loading the element B12. So if we go back to the, um, to the slide here, then we see that um, it, for thread Z one zero, uh, we still need to uh, have the thread to load the valid B12 element. So um, we, uh, we actually uh, have this kind of uh, situation where during the calculation, if we look at the calculation of uh, thread one zero, that thread is correspond to a non-existing C element, um, C32. Uh, so it shouldn't be affecting any of the C elements, but it still needs to participate in the loading of B12. So with these two constraints, we're going to go over a kernel design that systematically handles all these cases and uh, give us correct execution result, regardless of the, uh, the dimension of M, N, and K. So uh, we don't have any suggested reading for this particular lecture, so I will see you in the next lecture. Thank you.